Hi, Janet. Good afternoon. Dan Kennedy is inside one of the courthouse buildings right now as Anton Bell, the Hampton Commonwealth's attorney, is getting ready to hold a news conference, of course, about the outcome of this trial. A jury this afternoon handed down guilty verdicts on charges of murder and concealing a body in connection to Cody's death. Corey Bigsby is now convicted in Cody's murder. We watched as family members tried to leave, avoiding talking to the press. We spoke briefly with one of Bigsby's attorneys, the lead counsel in this case, Curtis Brown, who implied that there was perhaps already some opinions coming in to this trial. So he touched on that. And when I asked him what's next, maybe in the Court of Appeals, he kind of avoided that answer a little bit. But when Dan stepped out of the courthouse to let you all know about the guilty verdicts, what I saw in the courtroom is Bigsby completely emotionless. And that's pretty much how he stayed throughout this entire trial. Throughout the end, he handed his family members his baseball cap and he let the sheriff's deputies handcuff him and he went into a back room, so he is now back in custody here in Hampton. I can also tell you that Hampton, well, that Hampton Commonwealth's attorney, Anton Bell, motioned to revoke Bigsby's bond. As you all know, kind of in the duration of this trial, Bigsby has been out on bond, um, and so Commonwealth's attorney, Anton Bell, wanted to go ahead and revoke that bond because of the convictions this afternoon. The judge went ahead and granted it, even though Bigsby's attorneys pleaded with the judge. Bigsby attended all these court hearings, and he's been compliant in that way, and he has a monitor on. But despite that, like I said, Judge James Hawks granted that motion to revoke the bond. I'm hearing that Commonwealth's attorney Anton Bell is getting ready to speak right now. All right, Angelique, thank you. Let's go back to Dan and to the podium where Anton Bell is about to speak. All right, we understand that he stepped out just a moment ago. Dan, are you seeing him at all in the room or have you gotten any kind of an update on when he may actually come to the podium? Okay. Okay. Apparently, Dan is uh, not on mic now, but we know at any moment that Anton Bell, the Commonwealth's attorney for Hampton, will be talking about this case. He certainly understands the weight of it and understands just uh, the public interest in, in this case. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I can't remember a case where so many people were tuned in to wanting to know more about next steps and just what's going to happen um, and just what happened today. There, you can see there is that the fence that I was talking about earlier, all the stuffed animals and, okay, let's go back to that podium and Mr. Bell is about to speak. Sir. I specifically asked for co-counsel and the chief of police to be here beside me. So tell me, are you guys ready? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm gonna say to God be the glory because I am a spiritual person and I believe that he was literally ordering the steps of this trial. As many of you know, when we started out with this particular case, it was, we were already behind the eight ball because we were already six months behind what had actually occurred. And we were able to prove that. But when someone has that much of a lead ahead of you, it makes it very difficult trying to go back and put the pieces together. So let me just first thank my trial and my litigation team. Uh, first with Dylan Arnold, who is a deputy in my office. Uh, he has done a phenomenal job in trying this case with me. And also my victim service director and my victim service assistant director, uh, Carla Reeves and Latasha Power Mason in the back, uh, respectively, uh, just being able to help us with the number of witnesses. You guys know that there, there were a 
a number of witnesses that were extremely large in number and we were able to kind of, you know, pare it down to just the necessary witness to be able to put this case on my, the paralegals that were involved, uh, uh, Ebony Perry, uh, who was the lead paralegal, and my assistant, Nicolette Brown, who was also a part of this litigation team, my amazing investigators, uh, who just did an awesome job in being able to put this case together, and then my in-house investigators, who also uh, helped with being able to put all the things together. But can I kind of focus a little bit first on Dina Abdul Kareem, the mother of Cody. I am extremely proud of her. It took such courage. And the reason why I say it took such courage, because there are things that happened behind the scenes in that relationship that the public did not know. And there were things that occurred that we could not bring into the court case because it would have been seen as prejudicial. So she had to sit there, as many of you heard, and really be defamed. She had to sit there and be called a bad mother. She had to sit there and really be looked down upon and keep her silence. And she did it with such grace and with such dignity. So this case was, um, it, 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 for her, it was some level of a resolution and some level of accountability. It would never really be closure because here's the problem. We still don't have a body. We still do not have the body and probably would never have the body. So you can never bring complete healing and closure as a result of that. But nonetheless, for her, it was a day of victory and a day of justice. What she knew in her gut that this man, this, this person, I won't call him a man, but this person had done such horrendous things to her baby and he's now being held accountable for that. I have the chief of police up here, uh, Chief Jimmy Wideman, on purpose. He doesn't like to be in the front of the camera, but I want him here because I really wanted to address the media to a certain degree in reference to uh, a lot of the things that were said concerning if the police department had done enough, whether the police department followed certain leads, whether the police department followed tips, whether the police department um, had, had rushed to justice and so forth. And they took a beating in the beginning. They really did, uh, and, and I'm so grateful for uh, former detective Stephen Rohde, who, who I personally asked to be on this task force concerning investigating this case, and he took that job and he took ownership of it. And that is what our department is made of. They're made up of men and women who love their community, who love to see people find some level of justice for wrongs that have been committed against them. And so I wanted the chief here because I am so proud of your department chief. I'm so proud of how you also maintain your dignity and grace in the midst of the slander that took place. Um, there were, uh, particularly from the defense council, a number of press interviews and even a number of uh, press conferences that she, she gave. And if you guys noticed, I was unusually silent in this case. Normally, I, I, I don't have a problem talking to the press. I've never had a problem talking to the press. But I was very intentional in being silent concerning this case because I did not want anyone to be able to say that I tainted any potential jury pool. I didn't want anyone to say that we are trying to get a narrative out there that would be prejudicial to the defendant. I purposely waited until this trial was concluded and the jury, the community, spoke and said guilty and then to speak to all of you. It's been a long journey, a long road. Commonwealth has never asked for a continuance in this case. If you all recall, every continuance, every delay has been by the defense. We have been ready 
day one. And we've been ready day one because the facts were there, the evidence was there, and our police department did an amazing job in being able to piece this puzzle together to get us to this day. And would it not be poetic justice that the day that we chose for the sentencing to be the anniversary, the third anniversary of the day that the defendant was convicted of murdering his three-year-old child, which is June 18th, 2024. So just pointed justice. So with all of that, I open the floor to questions. Mr. Bell, you put a, can you talk about the decision to put a seven-year-old on the stand, and would this verdict have been possible without his testimony? It was a puzzle. And so what I had to do is put together a puzzle. And he was a big piece of that puzzle, but we believe that each piece was dependent on other pieces of that puzzle. He was able to confirm that June 18th date as far as when it happened, and he was also able to confirm the fact that that baby had been dead for months because the last time he saw him, he was dead. And he went to the Bush Gardens in the Water Country USA right after that and that was July 5th through the 14th and 16th. So he was able to give us that date, but he was more so able to confirm that he was indeed dead and that that confession that was retrieved from that composition book was not some bogus confession of, as the defense was trying to make it out to be, trying to paint him to be crazy or, or tortured or in some manner uh, just losing it because he was going through this grief. No, his conscience was beating him up. His conscience was dictating why he was writing those letters, writing those confessions, saying those things, because that child was innocent. And the last image that that child had was his father beating him to death. And so his conscience, he couldn't take it. Attorney, uh, when did you find out that Corey Bigsby would not be testifying? And had he testified, what was going to be your plan of attack? I was going to have no mercy with him. If he took that stand, you would have seen another beatdown in the courtroom. It would have been a legal beatdown. So he would have, it would have been no mercy. And so that was his choice to not take the stand. We found out when, when, when they stated to the court that he was not going to take the stand. But cross-examination would have been something else to see. During the trial, Mr. Uh, Curtis Brown has a very repetitive and combative demeanor, especially during your case. What sort of challenges did that present? Well, here's the thing. My job is to represent the Commonwealth and the people of this city. His job is to represent his client. And so was he zealous in representing his client? Yes. Would I have done those things? Absolutely no, because I will not fall from dignity in order to lower myself to those standards. So that's his choice. He made it. He has to live with it. Yes, ma'am. Do you think Mr. Brown is going to file appeal in this case? Oh, I'm certain he will. But the Attorney General Office, they handle Commonwealth Attorney Appeals, and so we are confident that we absolutely laid out sufficient evidence for that appeal to be denied. What about the child neglect charges against Mr. Bigsby? Where do those go from here? Oh, we will try him on those cases, too. We want full and complete accountability. So that's next. Attorney, if he decides to allocute as to what, where the child is, and what he did with the child. Will you give him consideration in your sentencing recommendation? Did I answer your question? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> what, is your, what is your recommendation going to be? Forty-five years. Forty years for uh, second-degree murder, which is the max. Five years for discharging or discarding a uh, dead body. That's the most I can get. That's what I'm going to ask for. Sir, is it going to be up to the judge, or does the jury have a say in the sentencing? It is up to the judge. At what point in this case did you know that you had the right guy? Actually, early on. When he was over at the police department, there were things that were going on. For instance, we already knew what the search and rescue dog had detected. We already knew 
that the cadaver dog had already detected a, de a dead body. So we already knew a dead body had already been in that room early on, very early on. And so the question now was, how do we prove it? Because it's one thing for you to think this is what occurred. It's another thing to be able to prove it. And so as time began to lapse, more evidence start to come together. We were able to download the digital images showing timeline, timelines. We were able to talk to DeCorey because DeCorey was getting older. And, and, and for, for, so let me go here. So I'll, I'll go here because I could talk about that now. There was the allegation, and he hinted at it, but basically there was the allegation that uh, DeCorey was somehow coached by either his mother or coach by myself. I have done, uh, my, one of my specialties is um, trial cases involving children. I came to Hampton back in 20, <coughs> not 20, what was it, 2000. Wow, it's been 24 years. 2000, Peter's been a long time, hasn't it? So, uh, back in 2000, I came to Hampton and my specialty was child sexual assault cases. So I am very familiar, that's very familiar territory for me, to be able to uh, prepare a child for any type of testimony, any type of cross-examination, so forth. However, here was the thing with DeCorey. DeCorey was very young when it happened, and then DeCorey was dealing with that trauma, and he lived in D.C. So I had to build a rapport with him and be able just to get into his world where he could trust me. One of the questions I asked during Jury Vordier was, uh, do you find, would you find it difficult for a child to be able to trust an adult to tell them about their trauma? Absolutely, it would be very difficult. So I had to get in his world. So the few times that I met with him, uh, the first few times I met with him actually, we just got to know each other. It wasn't even what happened. I didn't even go there because he needed to be able to be disarmed. I had it to create a safe space for him to, at some point when I start speaking to him, that he will be willing to share. And each time I spoke with him, he revealed a little bit more, more details and so forth, which again is not unusual because again, the more I trust you, the more I'll share. The more I know that you'll protect me, the more I'll share. And that's what eventually happened. And whenever I speak with a child, whenever I prepare a child to testify, nobody else is allowed in the room. No victim service person, no parent, particularly a parent, because I don't need any interaction with the parent, and I wanna make sure that there's no influence from that parent. I have to make sure that whatever that child is telling me is what happened and they're not being influenced by any other person. And every time I spoke with him, I made sure no one else was in the room. So that child told you his trauma based upon his own recollection of that trauma. Yes, ma'am. Why was it in, important for you guys to revoke his bond today? Did you trust he was not gonna come back? I don't trust. <laughs> Let me just say this. This case impacted not just Cody or his mom, grandma, and their family. This case impacted the region. I had people texting me from Boston, from out of the area, wishing me good luck, um, expressing to me Please get justice for Cody. I had people throughout this region reaching out to our office saying, we're, we're praying for you. We're, we're, we're hoping the best, that things will come out, that the truth will come out. And so for him to be found guilty of brutally beating this baby and then to be able to walk out the courtroom would have been a slap in the face of the citizens in this region. And so it was extremely important that they saw the justice system work properly. Attorney, how important was it to show that there were no original pictures of Cody after June or July of 2021? 
It was extremely important because it helped us with our timeline to establish it and to prove it. Also, the very fact that other children were located, photos of other children were located in his databases, but none of Cody. So that would explain why Cody was not in those pictures. He wasn't alive. In addition to that, they were trying to make it seem as if Cody, if, even if he killed him, maybe he killed him after September when his sister testified, which we found to be very not credible, incredible because this person gave multiple interviews to individuals before the indictment for murder and she had already basically gave the timeline and then after the indictment in 2023 she all of a sudden is going to say oh he was with us in September but notice this they had a photo of the sister and DeCorey back in 2020 early 2020 which would have made DeCorey around three because he didn't turn four until December 24 so it would have made him around three 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 years old but she didn't have a photo of Cody. And she was asked, uh, this is a special occasion? You know, this is something to, to commemorate your mom's death and so forth, but you don't have a photo of Cody? You don't have any photo of any of the kids? None of them? Didn't happen. Your assistant, um, Attorney Dillon, did a wonderful job. How proud are you of him? Extremely. <laughs> Extremely. Uh, Mr. Arnold took ownership of this case. Some, this case has been going on for two years, and I wear multiple hats. Um, I'm also the president of the Virginia Association of Commonwealth Attorneys, so I'm the face of Commonwealth Attorneys throughout this state or this Commonwealth. Um, I'm also a minister, uh, husband, father. So I have a lot of hats. I'm a very busy person, uh, and so it was important that I had a second set of eyes. At some point in the case, sometimes you feel a little fatigue and you need a little um, boost in energy and his youth <laughs> absolutely gave me the boost that I need but more so he was that second set of eyes and he came in and he absolutely took ownership of this case as if it was his own case and so I'm extremely proud of him extremely I have a question. I don't know if you can answer this because of the nature, but if Mr. Bigsby actually took DeCorey to Bush Gardens repeatedly, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. if Cody was out of the picture, where were the twins? Home. He had no babysitter. Home. Is that the child neglect charge? Which I will not get into because I still have to try those. So I won't talk about the child neglect charges, but we allege that they were home. <clears throat> Mr. Um, I'm not trying to go. You know, I was mentioning what Miss Antoine Bell. How proud are you of yourself? This was a tough case. This was not. I know I'm gonna win. This was a very challenging case. Mm -hmm. The jury could win in either direction. How proud are you of yourself? Well, I don't put stock in myself. Uh, like I said, I'm a very spiritual person, and so I, I, I'm very proud of my God and what he was able to accomplish and what's able to put together. I really feel that he helped us begin to put these, piece, these pieces together. Uh, Mr. Arnold and I was talking. This is one of the rare occasions that a case actually gets better with time. The chief will tell you most cases don't get better with time. Witnesses get fatigued, uh, evidence can get lost, or people decide that they just don't want to cooperate. Uh, people die and you can't put that evidence in because that witness is no longer around. But this case actually got better with time. So with every delay that the defense through their strategy employed, it actually helped us and benefited us. And the reason I really believe it benefited us because, again, I believe that we were just, just servants to do the will and the business of the people. And today, the people prevailed. Chief, do you have anything to say? I know he talked about um, your department's role in this. Do you have anything to say about um, this verdict? Oh, well, of course. Today's been about justice for Cody. Always impressed and proud of Mr. Anton Bell and his staff. I um, mean, our work isn't done. Of course, we still have to look and recover Cody. So our efforts won't cease until that is accomplished. 
and uh, we offer the solicitation to the public to help us in that endeavor. I'd like to ask a question that's going to be kind of like off the record, but it has to be asked. Do y'all um, fear that they're going to file some type of lawsuit against Hamilton, Virginia? They could. Anybody can file a lawsuit against anyone if they want to. The question is, is there going to be any merits to that lawsuit? So, I mean, their choice. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, what, what? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And again, I appreciate all that you were able to do. Have a great day. Anton Bell. Yeah, justice prevailed is what he said. You kind of feel like you can just take a deep breath now that uh, we have reached this verdict and we've come to this point. Not a, not closure, as he says, but a resolution. Not closure because Cody's body has never been found. To God be the glory. That's the first thing that Anton Bell said. He says his team was ready from day one to bring this case against Bigsby says it was difficult because they were behind the eight ball because they were six months behind. That's because he says, and they have proven that little Cody died in June of 2021 when uh, that's when he died and not January of 2022 when he was reported missing. And it's the seven year old boy. He said that was the one that confirmed who confirmed that Cody died in June. All right, let's go to Dan Kennedy. He has been listening to the news conference. And Dan, your observations about uh, what Bell has said and how this case played out. <laughs> about the case? Um, yeah, if you don't mind, um, just, just ask you a quick question. Okay, all right. Apparently, he is doing some interviews. We'll go back to Dan. Um, but Bell talked about, you know, how he interviewed the little boy. I was talking about the seven year old boy, Cody's brother, who testified uh, in the trial. And the more he trusted Bell, the more he talked. And so Bell was able to get him to confirm that timeline. And he knew that it was June of 2021 when little Cody died. And about the confessions uh, from Bigsby, the confessions from jail, the things that he wrote in that composition book, uh, Bell says that was his conscience beating beating him up and that's why he wrote those things all right now Dan is ready um, he's done his interview so Dan your observations about what Bell said and how this case played out well, it was, a, it was a long time coming for his office. As you know, uh, this investigation first began in 2022, and I happened to be standing beside uh, one of the instrumental figures in this case from the beginning, uh, former Hampton Police Division Detective Stephen Rohde. Appreciate you being here, sure. Steve. Yeah. All right, you're now retired, but you, you were very involved in this case. So what's today like for you? Uh, I think it's a good step forward, like Mr. Bell said during the conference. They're halfway there. We got the conviction. He'll be in jail, but we still have to recover Cody you know, no matter what. And you were also involved heavily with the task force. Uh, I was leading that, yes. You were leading the task force. Can you just pull back the curtain now that we have a verdict and, and tell us all the work, if, if you can sum it up in a few sentences that went into trying to get to this moment today? Well, the task force entailed uh, several of us, uh, captains, sergeants, lieutenants, so it gave us a different insight of what we had to look for. and. We started from the beginning, you know, just scratch, like it just happened. We just got the call because we had to review all the statements from the officers that got, you know, got on scene and up to the point where we we're getting tips and we had to follow those tips up. And several of the tips led us to go different jurisdictions and out of state, obviously, to Maryland. Where we did a two-day intensive uh, search with the uh, cadaver dogs, dug a lot of areas, uh, walked through a lot of swamps and woods and, uh, and trying to find him. Well, thank you for all your work. Uh behind the scenes investigating and, and for talking with us today. It's an impressive 30 year career at Hampton Police Division. Uh, if there was a homicide during that time, he was likely investigating it. 